Tony went on to become one of the first Marshall Islanders to graduate from college and focused on helping his people to extricate themselves from the legacy of U.S. nuclear testing in his island country. He played a key role in the negotiations that led to the first compact of free association between the U.S. and the Marshall Islands and his country's independence. And he participated in the development of the Marshall Islands Constitution. Tony has increasingly focused his attention on the challenges of global warming and its effect on atoll populations. In February 23, he addressed the United Nations Security Council on the threat posed by climate change to the Marshall Islands' long-term viability and survival. On April 24th of this year, the Republic of the Marshall Islands galvanized world attention when it filed landmark cases in the International Court of Justice against the U.S. and the eight other nuclear-armed nations, claiming that they have failed to comply with their obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and customary international law. Those obligations are to pursue negotiations for the elimination of nuclear weapons. The Republic of the Marshall Islands also filed a companion case in U.S. Federal District Court. And for this courageous act, the Republic of the Marshall Islands is being awarded the Sean McBride Peace Prize by the International Peace Bureau in December. So please welcome Tony Thank you, Jackie. I, I am honored to be here. I, I am also very lucky to have this opportunity to thank you, all of you in this room, for all that you do, all that you believe in, all that you contribute to what we all think is a noble goal for all of us, the elimination of nuclear weapons. I did not bring any notes, and one of the things I must do also is to apologize for being a little late in arrival, because that may have contributed a little bit to our starting late. But uh, we left our stick charts, our navigational stick charts in Honolulu, <laughs> and I couldn't find our way most directly this morning. <laughs> uh, even if we did have them, I'm not sure we could use them with all these tall buildings blocking the horizon. I come from the Marshalls, where we lie barely two meters above sea level. As an atoll vulnerable country, we now experience the impacts of climate change. Of course, the conversation is about 50 years from now, or even maybe turn of the century. But we like to remind people that for us it's existential, it is now, it is occurring, it is presenting yet another uh, obstacle to safety, to survival of our country. People often ask, why is it that such a tiny little Nobody Nation wants to undertake such uh, campaign, such programs of uh, international intrigue and attention. When uh, some in the United States have actually suggested that lifting 53,000 people off of these small islands and dropping them in Wyoming or Montana or some other uh, not so populated state would st solve the problem just as easily. We <coughs> have been under the control of foreign governments literally since our discovery. Uh, the influence of the early traders, the early whalers, the early missionaries, the trading that was going on between the large countries as to what happened to the boundaries of the Pacific affected us most directly between 1857 and now. Of course, much of that is history, 
But next year being the 70th year of uh, anniversary of the end of World War II, because Jackie has already given away my age, <laughs> uh, I will also be 70 next year, February. I think that relating some of the issues that have, have uh, risen between 1945, 44, 45, and now, and, it's, and their impact upon our, our, our country would be an important addition to this, today's discourse. All the scientific facts of climate change, and nuclear weapons, and uh, nuclear power are in the brains of the collected wisdom here today. But I think I'd maybe put a little bit of a human face into this dialogue uh, to help understand why such a small little country would want to say and to do what we're doing in all of these areas, in all of these areas. At the end of World War II, the United States decided that it was going to use the islands of the Marshalls and perhaps even the rest of Micronesia, then known as the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands, as a strategic trust territory. They closed it off to any intervention from anywhere and allowed itself through the trust trusteeship agreement specific to the island, the power to develop bases and to test nuclear weapons. Because of that, the United States did not allow anyone in or out of the island without the express permission of the Admiral in Guam until 1968. There was no foreign investment allowed in these countries the Marshals, the United States of Micronesia, and Palau until 1973. Our entire future was based on the American interest in developing weapons and keeping the rest of the world from knowing exactly what they were doing. To this day, we are still trying to find out exactly what they were doing and are still running into severe obstacles to obtain the necessary information, still classified and considered secret in the interest of the United States. So when we decided in 1968 to go for independence for the Marshall Islands, to restore what we believe to be sovereignty stolen, we had not just a trusteeship agreement to terminate, but we needed to find a way to ensure that those obligations that the United States undertook in its acceptance of its role as administrator for the trust territory would have a way for forward to being completed because obviously we were ill prepared for independence even though the trusteeship agreement stipulated that it was the function of the administering authority to prepare us for independence. We were offered alternatives. We were told that perhaps if we chose Commonwealth, we might be better off than if we opted for independence. And this was part of the reason it took 17 years to negotiate the termination of the trusteeship and the recognition of the independence and sovereignty of the Marshall Islands. But throughout the whole process, the one thing, or the two things really I should say, but many people consider them to be one and the same, the two things that presented the greatest obstacle to agreement with the United States were the United States insistence that it would still retain absolute military power in the islands forever, forever. Mm. And two, how to deal with the damages of the nuclear testing program that took 
from 1946 until 1958, 12 years, and the equivalent of 1.7 Hiroshima shots every day, or 80% of all of America's nuclear testing program. Many would have given up early in the game because it seemed that it was not possible for us to reach agreement on either the restoration of our country, the compensation for the people who had been injured, or for the rights to function as a real independent nation. So, in order for us, and the sine qua non too, in order for us to be able to, to have been able to convince the United States to go back into the Security Council and say, we allow the Marshall Islands to go free again, we have to do two things. We have to give them permanent rights of defense and defense authority. This defense authority and responsibility also includes what we call the defense veto, where the United States can in fact uh, prevent another country from investing in the marshals or doing something in the marshals that they, in, they would, in their view, interpret to be inconsistent with that authority. And second, we had to agree on what they call the 177 Agreement, the <coughs> nuclear settlement for damages for both personal and property stemming from the nuclear testing program. Without agreeing to these two items, independence would not have been possible. As it turns out, to this day, we are still arguing over those two <laughs> items. We have an agreement in place, we have a treaty in place, we have a U.S. law that was enacted putting the compact into effect but there still is no agreement, there is no satisfaction on either count. As a tiny, vulnerable country, beginning in the meeting in Rio in 1992, it became obvious to our leaders that not only were we straddled with these two very troublesome burdens of post-colonial existence, but that a new one was coming around with very real similarities. First of all, we were being affected by emissions of large developed countries, something over which we had absolutely no control, much in the same way we had absolutely no control over the nuclear weapons being tested in our islands and affecting the local population. Secondly, we did not have the voice to actually reach the rest of the world to convince them that this problem was for real even then, in 1992. Let me just digress a little bit. In Rio plus 20, uh, two years ago, three, three years ago, we actually read the same opening paragraph of our <laughs> original president's speech to Rio 1992, because 20 years later, we found ourselves in exactly the same spot we were 20 years ago, vis-a-vis -vis climate change. It is difficult for small island countries to argue their case before the world in the area of climate change, just as it is very difficult for us to argue in the area of nuclear contamination. So why, why are the marshals fighting this fight, sometimes risking being called Don Quixote and other names uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, only the Jesuits forced us to? to learn in school. It is because we think that we have not only a righteous cause, we have a mandate 
that requires us to do this. I am a father of three, grandfather of nine, and great-grandfather of four. <laughs> I'm proud of it. But I must also tell them sometimes what I'm doing to make sure that their future is guaranteed. That they will have land, they will have a language, they will have a tradition, they will have access to their fisheries, their seabed, and the rest of the resources that God blessed them. And that some far away, distant, developed country is not going to continue to poison this earth in such a way that we cannot guarantee that for them. That is the human role I want to inject into this discussion. I thank you for having me here. We'll be in New York for a week talking climate change, but I'm sure you know that this other issue is not going to be far behind. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. You are such an inspiration to us. And if we can, if our speakers stick to their time, we should have some time for questions. And, and Tony agreed to stick around. So our next speaker is John Burroughs, Dr. John Burroughs, Executive Director of the New York-based Law uh, Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy, which is the United Nations Office of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms. And he is a member of the international legal team that is representing the Marshall Islands in the nuclear zero cases before the International Court of Justice. His publications include a chapter on international law in assuring destruction forever, nuclear weapons modernization around the world, and the book, The Legality of Threatered Use of Nuclear Weapons, a guide to the historic opinion of the International Court of Justice. John? It's indeed an honor to be able to speak after Tony De Bruyne, and he uh, is playing a leadership role on the abolition of nuclear weapons now because of the lawsuits which I will discuss. But for those of you who don't know, uh, he is really uh, also widely quoted on issues regarding the climate negotiations which are supposed to culminate next year. And that's why he and the president of the Marshall Islands are here is for the climate summit uh, taking place at the UN uh, coming up in the next few days. So you're sort of a poster grandfather for this workshop. <laughs> Great grandfather. Yeah. Uh, the Republic of Marshall Islands needs our support, needs the support of the public and non-governmental organizations to carry forward its initiative on nuclear abolition. And there's a handout there uh, from the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. It's among uh, the literature uh, on what you can do in the way of uh, petitions and the like. Or if you can't find the handout, just go to nuclearzero.org. Uh, I am saying this very seriously. The people of the Marshall Islands need to know that a good part of the American public is behind them. That is very important. Uh, uh, we want to see this initiative continue, and we also want to see other governments join with uh, the Marshall Islands it, in its cases in the International Court of Justice. And uh, Tony DeBroom and members of the international legal team, uh, we have been talking with some other governments, and they're considering it, so it can happen, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. Right now, Marshall Islands is on its own uh, before the International Court of Justice. Uh, and so we need to ensure that uh, uh, the Marshall Islands itself, but also uh, nations around the world can, can see that the public is behind the Marshall Islands. So uh, let me try to go through some of the sort of substantive things I, I wanted to uh, say today. Uh, I'll be uh, uh, perhaps a, a little bit quick on some points, but I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards as need be. Uh, let me start about, uh, first by saying that some of you uh, undoubtedly have heard the phrase nuclear famine, and Joseph Gerson referred to it earlier. That refers to projections by physicians for social responsibility and others of widespread starvation 
resulting from nuclear explosions in numerous uh, urban areas. Uh, those explosions would generate soot and smoke that would circulate in the atmosphere on a scale causing global cooling, cooling and a subsequent decline in agricultural production. There's a handout entitled Self-Assured Destruction prepared by President of Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy and the All Souls Disarmament Task Force uh, that's on, on the table back there where you can go and find out more. And Martin uh, Fleck, who's here from Physician Social Responsibility in the back row, can, can also direct you to information about nuclear famine. So that is one connection between nuclear weapons and climate change, change of a different kind. But I'm going to focus on another. <clears throat> uh, nuclear disarmament and climate protection are both global, political, and legal processes. They both involve implementation of obligations contained in international legal agreements. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. In both cases, a central question is whether the United States and other countries are complying with their obligations, whether they are keeping their promises. Sounds boring, right? But it's an important question. First of all, because of the imperative of ending the threats posed by climate change and nuclear weapons. If there is compliance, problem solved. It's important also because upholding international commitments is key to a, a decent and livable world order on war and peace, economy and health, biodiversity, and, and much more. So, uh, as has been mentioned, in April, Marshall Islands filed applications in, in the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, against the nine nuclear armed states, uh, claiming they have violated their obligations under the NPT and customary international law. The nine states, probably some of you can name all of them, United States, United Kingdom, France, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea. The Marshall Islands also filed a companion case against the United States in the U.S. Federal Court in San Francisco, in which they are being represented by the law firm Keller Rohrbeck. Uh, so the international legal team is not working on that case, but we, of course, are talking with those lawyers. This is the first time uh, since 1996 uh, that the International Court of Justice has been asked to address issues relating to nuclear weapons. The ICJ is the judicial branch of the United, uh, of the United Nations. In its 1996 opinion, uh, <clears throat> interpreting Article 6 of the NPT, the court unanimously concluded that there exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament, all its aspects under strict and effective international control. So what's the situation in the ICJ? <clears throat> Three of the nine states possessing nuclear arsenals, the UK, India, and Pakistan, have accepted the general jurisdiction of the court when the opposing state has done so, as the Marshall Islands has. The cases are proceeding as to those states. Uh, and so there's a briefing schedule, the Marshall Islands will be filing briefs in December, January, and February against those three countries. Uh, mostly it's going to concern preliminary issues of whether the cases are suitable for adjudication by the ICJ. There will probably be a hearings uh, by the end of 2015 or possibly early 2016. Uh, those are, you know, challenging issues about whether the cases are suitable for adjudication by the court, uh, but we think we can win them. Then we would go on to the merits phase, uh, the substantive phase of the case, and that could take uh, another two or three years of uh, litigation. Uh, so concerning the other six states that have not accepted the, uh, the jurisdiction of the court, the general jurisdiction of the court, the Marshall Islands is calling upon them to accept the jurisdiction of the court in this particular case uh, to explain to the court their positions. They say, the United States says, we support the international rule of law. We are complying with Article 6. Well, fine, come before the court and explain how you're doing that. So far, they have not uh, done so. Uh, the claims before the court are for breach of the obligation 
to pursue negotiations leading to the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, the, I uh, read you what the International Court of Justice said that obligation was. Uh, by refusing to commence multilateral negotiations, accomplishing that, or by implementing policies contrary to the objective of nuclear disarmament. If you're building up your nuclear infrastructure, nuclear forces for decades to come, you're not working in sync with the objective of nuclear disarmament. Also, an interesting uh, second claim, and that is for breach of the obligation regarding cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date. That's also contained in Article 6 of the NPT. First of all, by modernizing nuclear forces and in, in infrastructure, and in the case of Pakistan and India, quantitative buildup. Third, breach of the obligation to perform these obligations in good faith. Now I'm going to come back to good faith. But how can you be acting in good faith if you're planning to retain nuclear forces for decades into the future? That's, that's the question we want the court to address. And finally, we have a claim for interfering with the other countries uh, that don't have nuclear weapons in their effort to meet their international obligations. Because Article 6 of the NPT applies to all members of the NPT, uh, not, not just to uh, the nuclear armed states. So the relief we're asking, now you might ask, well, how can these cases be brought against countries outside the NPT? It's based on general international law. Uh, lawyers call it customary international law that grows out of the NPT, that grows out of the long history of UN resolutions, and also reflects, and I think this is fundamental, it reflects the incompatibility of use of nuclear weapons with international law. <coughs> The relief the Marshall Islands is asking for is, first of all, a declaration from the court that the respondent states are in violation of those obligations. And secondly, in order uh, to take steps to comply with the obligations, including the commencement of negotiations, multilateral negotiations, aimed at bringing about a convention for the global elimination of nuclear weapons. So you can see much more uh, including a paper I did on the current status of the cases at nuclearzero.org and also <coughs> at my organization's website, lcmp.org. How much time do I have? You have five minutes. So what does good faith mean? Good faith means to keep your promises and to do so in a way that is true to the purposes of the promises. Mohammed Bajawi, who was president of the International Court of Justice, in 2008 has said, good faith is a fundamental principle of international law without which all international law would collapse. So good faith, first of all, requires implementation of agreed commitments. Secondly, good faith requires that governments not take actions incompatible with the achievement of agreed objectives, like uh, nuclear disarmament like stabilization of greenhouse gases, which is provided for in uh, the UN Framework Convention. Uh, third, when there are negotiations, and there will be negotiations on climate, uh, next year really they're already starting, uh, there are no negotiations on nuclear disarmament right now. Can you believe it? But that is, that is the situation. Uh, when there are negotiations, good faith requires, among other things, awareness of the interests of other parties, and a persevering quest for an acceptable compromise. Uh, so let me just say a few words about uh, climate protection. Uh, the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change sets out general obligations and also envisages further cooperative action, including the adoption of additional agreements. The ultimate objective, as I just said, is stabilization of greenhouse uh, gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous human-caused interference with the climate system. Quite clear. Uh, it has a very general obligation saying that developed countries uh, shall adopt national policies and take measures on the mitigation of climate change. So pursuant to that framework convention, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted. And it set a goal of roughly 5% by 
2010. So the amount of reduction required by the Kyoto Protocol is far from adequate. But some governments nonetheless found the uh, targets hard to meet until the Great Recession reduced economic growth rates. Uh, the United States, China, Pakistan, and Brazil never became parties to Kyoto Protocol. But still, for the United States, as of 2012, there was about a 5.4 increase in greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990. So sort of within the range of what uh, Kyoto had set as, uh, as targets. Uh, but uh, all the climate experts will, will tell you the Kyoto targets were very far from, from what was required, required to address the problem. Uh, voluntary commitments have also been made in the context of annual meetings of parties to the UN Framework Convention. And the recent regulatory plan that was adopted by the administration uh, this summer, the Obama administration, uh, represents an effort to meet its commitment to reduce greenhouse gra uh, gas emissions by 20, 17% percent by 2020 compared to 2005. That's the regulatory scheme under which uh, states will be required to reduce power plant emissions by 26% by 2020. So now we have a process to create a post-Kyoto agreement, still under the framework of the, frame, uh, the Framework Convention. I, perhaps Tony will have a chance to talk a little bit about the state of climate negotiations. What I have learned is that it's unclear what the form of the agreement will be. Uh, it could be another agreement like the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, it could be a different sort of binding legal instrument. But apparently what the uh, Obama administration wants to see is an outcome document with legal force. So, <laughs> I'm a lawyer, but that's a little, that's, the phrase is a little hard to understand, but I would take it to mean <laughs> carrying forward obligations from the Framework Convention and adding on political commitments uh, to it. Uh, uh, so we have uh, a question uh, that is common to both the treaty regimes for nuclear disarmament and uh, climate protection. Are the fundamental obligations being met? Are they being met in good faith? And I think they are not being met. And it's part of what uh, the public in this country needs to do is to say the United States needs to start uh, playing a constructive role in fulfilling the goals uh, uh, of these uh, international agreements, which uh, under the US Constitution are part of the law of the land. Thanks, John. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, um, Joseph asked me to announce that the Asia Pacific Workshop uh, that had been scheduled for this afternoon has been canceled due to a scheduling conflict. And I would also like to ask uh, people to sign in on the sign-up sheet that's going around if, it's, uh, if they haven't done so already. So it's now my pleasure to introduce my friend Frank County. I just checked with him this morning to make sure I, it was okay for me to call him Frank. <laughs> And Fred, right? And Fred. <laughs> um, Frank is the mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, and he is the reason why this particular banner is up uh, for this session. Uh, he's a lifetime resident of Des Moines who has a long history of civic leadership and commun community involvement. Now in his third term as mayor, um, Frank is <laughs> committed to promoting the city's goal of creating a sustainable green community for future generations. He established the Des Moines Energy and Environmental Task Force. Um, his successes include partnerships to reforest the city and receipt of a federal grant to purchase a fleet of energy efficient hybrid and hydrogen powered automobiles. Um, Mayor County has gained national recognition through his leadership roles with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He was one of only eight U.S. mayors chosen to formulate regional environmental policies for American cities through his work with the international group local governments for sustainability. Um, he was a delegate to meetings in Copenhagen, Mexico, and Warsaw, um, where local governments uh, participated in framing for the new uh, 2015 UN Protocol on Climate. And he is one of three mayors, only three mayors, inducted into the new National Environmental Hall of Fame. 
Um, Mayor County uh, also joined Mayors for Peace in 2007 and has been one of our most reliable members, regularly co-sponsoring annual Mayors for Peace nuclear disarmament resolutions in the U.S. Conference of Mayors and speaking on behalf of Mayors for Peace at the UN. And I hope he'll tell us more about the most recent uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors resolution. In 2008, Mayor County hosted a conference on nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and climate change in Des Moines, organized by Western States Legal Foundation and Lawyers Committee on Nuclear Policy and local groups. We're two of the groups, of course, hosting this panel. So again, it's my great pleasure to introduce Mayor Frank County of Des Moines. I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, to look out and uh, I, I will also tell you as I, as I think about it and I listened to the first uh, uh, panel and I thought I don't want to say anything I was going to say because I'm talking to everybody that knows everything that uh, we want to talk about here and uh, are experts in the field. And so uh, thank you for all the work that you do in the field and to put together the science and the support and the factual information that helps those of us uh, at the local level, at the national level, uh, kind of articulate a, a position that uh, we can um, uh, sort of beg off on being the, the owners and the creators of facts, but we can present them and, and hope that people receive them. So keep up your work, keep working at it. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what mayors do out there. And uh, it, it's, as Jackie said earlier, uh, I've been involved in, in a lot of things as, as I think of back uh, over the years. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that take office and for whatever reason, uh, whether I serve sort of in a nonpartisan way. Uh, I, I serve Democrats and Republicans and probably no parties and a few communists and socialists, but I never asked a one of them when they called and needed help, what party they were in. Uh, that doesn't affect us. We serve people every single day, and it doesn't make any difference whether they're men or they're women or they're young or they're old. Uh, it, we, that's what we do. So it's, it's interesting. I, I do have uh, a lot of good friends uh, out there that um, I'd say that tongue in cheek. Uh, is I have stood up not only for climate change but also uh, illegal guns and background checks and things like that. So I uh, will tell you that I probably won't get any campaign contributions from the NRA. Uh, but it, 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 it talks about safety to me. It talks about the future of our cities. It talks about how we protect our people. And uh, in local government, uh, you know, safety and quality of life are paramount. That's what they look to us for. And uh, not whether they're, you know, there's a partisan interest one way or the other on it. It's how do we make that happen and how we get it done and what resources do we use to make that happen and what are some of the things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to do that. You know, we look at violence, we look at fire, we look at disasters. In, in our city, we've identified 27 different types of disasters that could take place in the heart of America, uh, in Des Moines, Iowa. And uh, the one that seems to make the newspaper the most is our floods. Uh, we're getting to be real experts on floods. And uh, it, it, so people come to us and, and talk to us about our preparedness and our, our mitigation plan and our response and our recovery. And, and what resources do we have and capacity do we have to respond to those kinds of things. And so we have, you know, put together a, a plan and uh, um, done a lot of internal work. Uh, at the same time, you've got a whole bunch of citizens out there. We've got about in our, our metro area, our MSA, if you will, there's five, six hundred thousand people in the city of Des Moines. We're about 210 specifically. Uh, but we're, we're the heart of Iowa, the capital city, and so people look at us to uh, lead and, and do certain things. And I will tell you that at other levels of government, we're, we're seeing less and less support for the work that we have to do. And so I, whether it's state government or it's federal government, we're fighting for dollars and, and there's all kinds of arguments going up, up, uh, up the ladder. And, and going on in, in Washington, and, and I will say uh, this sort of is a, is a little side comment. I was asked this last year, 
we have a number of uh, open seats, whether it's the U.S. Senator or U.S. Congress, or uh, they were looking for somebody to, to run for governor for a minute. And I thought about certainly the, the first of all, the, the two going to Washington, and I work a lot with those folks that are in there. I go in and I lobby them, and I tell them about a lot of things that have to be done that we've talked about here this morning. But you know what, at the, at the end of the day, it almost seems like they don't get much done. Because the right saying one thing, the left saying one thing, the Democrats, Republicans, whatever it is, and so they're in, they're locked down. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing: they do seem to to uh, uh, finance, and it seems to be war, and that bothers me because there's so much need uh, that we've talked about here today, and talked about in, in all kinds of hunger, homeless uh, conversations, whether it's in the United States, Des Moines, Iowa, around the world. These are issues that localities have to deal with in our places and figure out what we're doing. Uh, but it's interesting, by the way, as we look back through the history of the United States and say, you know, war's not very popular. Uh, people don't like the idea, especially if they've experienced it, whether uh, it's World War II, it's uh, the Korean conflict, it's Vietnam, it's everything that's happened, uh, you know, in the Middle East since then, uh, in, in police actions or whatever it is that we call some of these things. And, and don't you find it sort of interesting? They must have looked at it as they were doing budget conversations and they said, uh, you know, it's really hard to sell and get people to vote for candidates that support war. So why don't we change the name of the department from the War Department to the Defense Department? Now all of a sudden everybody says, oh, we gotta have defense. And so all of a sudden now we're talking about uh, billions and billions of dollars, not only for the war machine itself, but also for nuclear weapons. That uh, I think as um, Joseph said earlier, you know, we talked about the US uh, using nuclear weapons to dominate the world. And quite frankly, at least in part, I, I uh, agree with our, our president uh, when he said, uh, that, uh, you know, just because you have the biggest hammer doesn't make every problem a nail. And I agree with that. So let's show some evidence of that and, and let's quit making uh, hammers. So it affects all of us. I have uh, participated uh, um, in international discussions around climate change uh, starting in Copenhagen internationally and certainly in the United States in the Congress of Mayors before and with uh, ICLE, uh, our International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, and we do, we're doing all kinds of stuff in Des Moines that we think is great and, and we're going to save at least our part of the world. But as you look at it and you discover that, that there's our little part of the world and everything that we do uh, certainly is demonstrates a possibility uh, of, of what needs to be done, what could be done, what should be done. But we've got to sell that every place across this country and across this continent and across this globe to be able to understand what it is that we're doing. And I will, uh, uh, by the way, quickly uh, uh, thank uh, Tony uh, for the work that they've done and, and uh, in reference just to cover the ground uh, here, uh, Jackie, uh, the resolution that we introduced, by the way, the US, U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, calls for the constructive good faith U.S. Uh, participation and good faith, I think, should be underlined, as uh, John mentioned a minute ago, what does that mean, uh, in international nuclear disarmament forums. That's the title of it. Uh, and specifically, one of our whereas is, is uh, whereas the people of the Republic of the Marshall Islands continue to suffer from the health and the environmental impacts of 67 above ground <coughs> nuclear weapon test explosions conducted by the United States uh, in their islands between 1946 and 58, the equivalent of 1.6 Hiroshima sized bombs detonated daily for 12 years. Uh, whereas the RMI on April 24, 2014 filed a uh, landmark case in the ICJ against the U.S. and eight other nuclear armed nations claiming that they have failed to comply with their obligations under the NPT and customary international law to pursue negotiations 
for the worldwide elimination of nuclear weapons and filed a companion case in the U.S. federal court. Uh, so thank you for your work. Let's give him another great big hand for it. Mayors, interestingly enough, this passed unanimously uh, the conference mayors. Now, as you can tell, by the way, it's a fairly lengthy document. I'm not sure every one of them read every <laughs> piece of it, but uh, I, I, I think that their intent is in the right place and their hearts are in the right place. Um, so, where do we go? What is it that we're going to do to uh, try to educate the rest of the world on what needs to be done, because I don't need to educate anybody in this room, but I think we need strategies as to how it is that we're going to address these issues, whether it be climate or war or nuclear pro proliferation, or the effort to do the opposite. Uh, how is it that we get that message out? And it's interesting to me as we talk about educating and informing our local citizens, because that's what, what we can do. And by the way, back to the, the other thing, I decided not to run for any of those offices for the reason that they're not getting anything done. I can get something done in Des Moines, Iowa. I can go out and talk to mayors around the world and we, we have a nice conversation around the table and it doesn't involve politics and partisanship. It involves helping our people and getting things done and looking at the future, not only for ourselves, but our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. I like that discussion. I don't like not getting stuff done. And it doesn't make any difference how much I get paid or anything else. What matters is that we're making a difference uh, today and for future gen generations. But as I thought about it and, and we look at it, and I know I've had these discussions with others uh, regarding climate and greening America's schools and greening schools around the world and greening our education process, and you think, how in K through 12, how is it that we do it? There's been some initiatives that would say, well, let's just do it. Let's, let's teach an environmental class. Everybody ought to take an environmental class. I say, no, let's, we can do that. But they ought to insert it in every single subject that's in there. There ought to be an English literature. It ought to be in history. Oh, let's talk about the industrial age. And we started using a whole lot of coal. What was the impact of that? Let's do it in math and science. Let's talk about the calculations and what the correlation is and the relationship is between the increase in carbon, the increase in, in the volatility of, of climate on, the, on this planet. Let's put it in every subject, K through 12, and then let's emphasize what needs to happen at higher education sources, whether it's at uh, undergraduate degrees or it's at graduate degrees, and let's also figure out how we educate what we hope to be lifelong learners. People are listening to stuff, and a lot of people think they're getting educated by listening to a variety of media out there. And so um, I, I try to listen to all media. There's some that I, I get so sick that I shut it off pretty quick. But it's interesting to uh, listen to a perspective, you know, on one side that seems to be MSNBC that, you know, seems to talk about facts a lot, and CNN that does some of the same, and then Fox that talks about opinions a lot. And so, you know, when the discussion of, of climate change gets reduced to uh, an economic discussion, all of a sudden we're, we're off point. It, it's sort of, wait a minute, what are we talking about? We're talking about climate over here. Shouldn't we be able to connect uh, a green plan to the future economy of the United States and the, and the world and, and how it is that we do those sorts of things? But sometimes the, the, the discussion gets so totally diverted, we can't even have a discussion about the issues that really uh, mean something to us and, and make a difference. So I think that somehow our educated public has to let not only the media, but those elected officials, those ones that do tend to be somewhat partisan, uh, know what, what's going to make a difference. This is important to me. And it's not just the people in, the, in this room. Somehow we've got to get a groundswell of support, not just the protesters that are, that are getting uh, uh, arrested and put in jail uh, periodically, but uh, let's, let's see what we can do out there to get uh, folks to understand. And I've got to tell you, some of the easiest ones are the, the K through 6th grade, 8th grade. 
they learn really quick and you give them facts and, and they take them home. Uh, I remember in my generation when Ronald McDonald was telling us that we ought to go get a Big Mac and a French fries in a mall uh, at least once or twice a week and uh, we transferred that conversation to our parents. Why aren't we stopping at McDonald's and getting a you know, Big Mac French fries in a mall? It sounds really good. And you know what? McDonald's grew like crazy and they kind of crushed everybody else. I mean, remember Henry's Hamburgers? Where are they now? They didn't have Ronald McDonald. But you know what? Ronald McDonald is not so visible anymore, which I find interesting. Uh, that uh, there was a time, let's say about a decade ago, when Ronald McDonald was the most visible person in silhouette, at least in the United States, if not the world. He was uh, more visible and, and people knew who it was more quickly than, than, than Jesus and Santa Claus. <laughs> that blows my mind. <laughs> but it was. Somehow we have to raise the awareness of the connectivity of the future of this planet and climate and peace and nuclear. And I'm, uh, I've been reading one of my good friends on, on climate change and that I've talked to a number of times through the years, Dr. James Hansen. I agree with him on about 90% of everything that he says. I am not so much in agreement and I'm not the scientific expert here, but I appreciate some of the words that have been said earlier this morning when they talked about nuclear not being an option. So let's, no carbon, no nuclear, let's look at renewables, let's figure out how we're gonna do it. You know, and as we think about uh, uh, the future, and, and um, Andrew earlier said that, uh, you know, war makes states. And uh, while we've changed the name of it, now it's defense, uh, it gives, purpose in a, in a way to grab funds to, to do certain things and, and keep the national government at a level. Uh, but I want you to know that cities and localities, uh, peace and quality of life make cities. And if you think that a nuclear bomb over Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't change the quality of life in those places, you're mistaken. So let me quickly just uh, close and say I'd love to talk to any of you at any time. Uh, let's be partners. Let's try to get a word out. And uh, as I think about philosophy, a lot of my philosophy uh, through the years, given the age that I grew up with, came from rock and roll. <laughs> so as, as I think about uh, uh, the future and the serious discussions that we're having, whether it be climate or whether it be about peace and war, I think of a, a, a quote that, let us not speak falsely now, for the hour is getting late. Isn't he great? Another round for Mayor Kennedy. So let me just uh, mention one of the hats I wear, and the reason that I know Frank is uh, that I'm the North American Coordinator of Mayors for Peace, which now has well over 6,000 members internationally in 158 countries. Um, in the U.S., we now have, I believe, 203 members, um, and just in the last month, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Atlantic City, New Jersey have joined. Uh, we have so far been unsuccessful in enticing Mayor de Blasio to join, uh, so I'd like to invite you New Yorkers to help with that, and if you're not from New York, please enroll your mayor. It has the potential to be a very powerful, it already is a powerful organization, it could be more powerful in the United States. So I would like to now introduce my final friend on this panel, <laughs> Judith LeBlanc. Judith is the Field Director for Peace Action, a national grassroots organization representing 90,000 members, committed to a fundamental change in U.S. foreign policy. She coordinates the Move the Money campaign, an effort to organize grassroots coalitions of community, labor, and peace groups to change national spending priorities from wars and weapons to fund jobs, human needs, and steps towards a new economy that works for all. 
She is working with other national groups to develop alternatives for workers, their families, and communities who have depended on wars and newer who depend on wars and newer weapons for good-paying manufacturing jobs. Judith is a member of the Caddo tribe of Oklahoma, but she lives right here in Harlem, New York City. Judith. Thank you, Jackie. I'm really honored to be on this panel. I mean, is this the dream team of the global yeah. movement for a nuclear-free world and climate justice? Make it happen. And really, and isn't this the team that can help us answer the question of this panel? What, what to do when national politics are locked up on the big issues? All my relations. It's a phrase from a Lakota prayer, a phrase my ancestors used to express the interrelatedness of all people and with Mother Earth for all times. Endless interconnectedness. That is exactly how to describe the moment we are in. There's no possible way to save Mother Earth from destruction without believing and acting as an interconnected whole. Brothers Tony and John and the Marshallese people remind us of that connection. They challenge us to act as one in solidarity with the Marshallese people to save Mother Earth and to save ourselves. The Non-Proliferation Treaty seems to be hopelessly stonewalled by our government. What will it take to compel our government and the governments around the world to negotiate in good faith? Well, you know, the mayor, he knows all too well the challenge of dealing with the crisis of everyday living in our communities alongside of the necessity to respond to the global threats of climate crisis and nuclear annihilation. How do we make the connections between everyday issues to the bigger catastrophic dangers in a meaningful way to have real political impact? We know that nuclear weapons and a militarized national budget are the biggest obstacles to meeting the needs of our communities and climate crisis globally. More money is spent on wars and weapons than on jobs and public transportation and all public services, as well as addressing climate crisis. It was a very important victory for the Mayors for Peace to have succeeded in moving the U.S. Conference of Mayors to pass a strong resolution that was drafted by our friends sitting at the table, a strong resolution for nuclear disarmament and demilitarizing the federal budget. Yet, how do we use these public affirmations to build our political power? Building grassroots political power is the only path to changing government policies. Building our political power, that is what organizes, especially at the local level, from all the social movements are grappling with. And some say, some of our best organizers say, and even the mayor said, nothing's happening in DC, so go local. Go local in our organizing. Build up local victories. Yet, Local victories do not necessarily build towards a national policy shift. Yes, the all our relations philosophy, that that theory of change comes into play. Plain and simple. Like my grandma's fry bread, it's all about the right combo of flour, water, and the temperature of the oil. And like political struggle, it's not a simple process. It's an interaction of all the ingredients and the conditions, which makes for a great, not good, but great fry bread, as well as addressing some of the most pressing global dangers that we face. I want to share a problem with you. I want you to walk a mile in my moccasins and the moccasins of the organizers who are preparing for the 2015 civil society events, April 24th through the 26th, 2015, at the time of the United Nations Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. An international committee of peace and justice groups is planning civil society events. We had our first meeting yesterday. So I want to share with you uh, some of my impressions, 
some of what I think are the biggest challenges we face in successful events at the time uh, in April 2015. The plans I'd organized for the last weekend of April, April 24th to the 26th, the tried and true events, similar to this climate justice weekend. I think there may be some leaflets here that can give you more detailed information. On Friday night and Saturday, April 24th and 25th, we will hold an international conference with speakers and workshops projecting a global perspective on nuclear abolition, climate and economic justice and demilitarizing the global economy. On Sunday, of course, we're gonna match we're going to do street actions. We're going to send a signal to the UN conference that the world stands for peace, for abolition, and for climate and economic justice. The day will end with a festival to solidify and inspire our base, grow the organizational infrastructure of the movement, and do some public education. But the biggest challenge is not those events. It's what happens between now and April 2015 to generate the popular political pressure on all the governments for real steps towards negotiations in good faith. How to go local when we know that the change we want is global and national. We need a multiplicity of tactics, tactics shaped by the goals of impacting the UN conference, our governments, and growing a movement for the long haul. The right combo of tactics, like my grandma's fried bread. Yes, we are mobilizing around a UN event that will deal with a treaty that is roadblocked, sidelined, and sandbagged by the US and other nuclear powers for years. And although it hurts to admit it, the global and the US abolition movements, well, we're not yet a politically empowered grassroots movement, as much as it hurts to admit that. But we have hardcore, devoted, true-believing organizers, some are sitting on this panel, others are in the room, who believe we must and we can build up an abolition movement that can save Mother Earth from nuclear and climate destruction. And that the biggest obstacles to climate justice are wars, weapons, and militarism. So, walk a mile in our moccasins. I want to know what you think. What are the opportunities to mobilize public awareness and organize a grassroots movement that connects saving Mother Earth to the ongoing local struggles in our communities? What creative tactics are needed to galvanize grassroots attention? Clearly, we need local activities which transcend social movement boundaries between climate, economic justice, racial equity, workers' rights, and peace. That's clear. We also need the big picture global dimension. The Marshall Islands lawsuit is the greatest handle we have to raise up our global interconnectedness, solidarity with the Marshallese people to save our planet and ourselves. What do we do locally to build our political power globally and have impact on our governments? Well, we build alliances between social movements and elected officials, generate public awareness using every tool, social media, teach-ins, opinion pieces and newspapers, passing resolutions like at the US Conference of Mayors to deepen the understanding with the goal of deepening the understanding of the roots and the interrelationship of problems and solutions. We need a blended, interconnected approach between local organizing and consciousness raising and national and global initiatives. The right blend of water, flour, and very hot oil. What do we do when national politics are locked up? Well, frankly, it's not brain surgery. It is not the immaculate conception here. We shake up politics with a multiplicity of tactics. Number one, using global opportunities to shed light on the roots of the crisis problems of everyday living, knowing that local victories are constrained by national policies and global conditions. Number two, we use opportunities for global collaborations to reveal the local consequences of an action to build our movement. There are local consequences if we do not act together at the grassroots. Number three, 
We build across boundaries of social movements. We engage our local elected officials, our national elected officials, to maximize our strength and impact and build awareness of common needs and long-term solutions. solutions. We will get sidelined. We will be the lunatic fringe if we disconnect the local from national policies and global collaborations. So that is the path to changing national policies and global conditions, linking up the local with the global. A nuclear-free world, climate justice, is achievable if we focus on the here and now, giving local, going local, with an eye on root causes and solutions. So I invite you to join us, to put on our moccasins, or if you want to put on your sneakers, and join us in building towards this April 24th through 26th civil society events or, uh, that's around the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in April 2015. Because as Brother Tony says, we have a very righteous cause, and we have a mandate. The wisdom of my ancestors endures. We are all related. The solutions to big and small crisis problems are interconnected. Even in complicated political moments as we are in, we must not forget that we are all related. We are related in the struggle to save Mother Earth. Thank you.